as Jessica mentioned, I've been writing about the right to science and culture, and today I want to talk about one aspect of that writing. Louder. One aspect of my writing on the science and culture, uh, right to science and culture, focusing particularly on an understanding of science as including both scientific knowledge and the scientific enterprise or endeavor, as Jessica mentioned, but also science as technology. And I will argue that the right to science implies a universal entitlement of access to new technologies. Uh, and I will explain both why I think it's necessary that we understand the right that way and what concretely it means for intellectual property uh, as a determinant of access to new technologies. So this is the text uh, that both Jessica and I are working with. Everyone has the right uh, to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. That's the 1948 formulation. Uh, slightly different uh, in uh, the, the, as it plays out in the International Covenant. And if you understand uh, Jessica's portion of work on this right as focusing on science as process, the scientific enterprise, the scientific endeavor, right? I think we can tie that to this portion of the text. Uh, and I pick up where that leads off by focusing on this part, right? What is the benefits? What is the applications? Uh, this is the technology that comes out of scientific work, uh, and um, that is particularly important to think about access in the perspective of socioeconomic rights. Uh, so like so many of us, I have to nod uh, to the work of Professor Chapman before us. She is speaking about the uh, right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. What I like now to shorthand is the right to science, uh, and I think the fact that, that we have such a clunky term still in use is a sign of the relative immaturity of our discourse about this right. When we once spoke of the right to uh, enjoy the highest attainable standard of health, now we talk about the right to health, and that's sort of a sign that that conversation has come of age. Um, but she said, uh, this right is so obscure, so neglected in its interpretation, virtually that it almost might not exist. And the thing I want to point out here is how recently she said this. This is a quote from 2009, um, by which time we already had a 14-page, 18-page general comment um, on the right to health and what specifically it meant for government obligations. So uh, that was where my project picked up. I wanted to interpret what this text meant. Surely it must have meant something to the people who adopted it. And so my project was to develop a theory of this right to science and culture. And um, why would I say that we need a, a theory to start with? Well, let me make an analogy that's familiar to us from domestic uh, jurisprudence. So our Constitution has this this text that states a principle in very vague terms uh, that doesn't make clear what the specific corresponding duties are of government. And for a long time, that text led to no significant litigation, no judicial limitations, uh, uh, judicially applied meaning. And then we had theories of this right developed, theories of the First Amendment, such as the marketplace of ideas. That's what the First Amendment is there to do or the, the self-realization, personal expression um, theories. And once you have this theoretical grounding, then you have a principle to guide your interpretation of the right and imagine its applications to concrete situations. So here's my theory of the right to science and culture. What the framers were thinking about in the um, 1940s as they articulated this and added this to the monopoly of human rights that were already recognized in so many national constitutions. And think about some of the things um, that while Eleanor Roosevelt was negotiating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, some of the things that had been happening uh, at home. Her husband was working to expand access to electricity through government efforts to build that technology out of something that would actually be affordable to ordinary Americans. There was a popular campaign to publicly fund research on polio, which resulted in a low-cost vaccine that was protected uh, from being wrapped up in patents um, and made exclusive that way. So the first premise of my theory, the right to science and culture, is that it is a commitment to 
treat knowledge as a global public good, something that should be shared, something that should be collaborated, something that uh, is not a scarce resource, but actually the more broadly it is shared, the more it grows. <laughs> Uh, and a commitment that public policy should be oriented to encourage its expansion uh, and to check attempts to monopolize it for private benefit. The second touchstone is that the right to science and culture implicates an entitlement to particularly necessary goods, much like the right to education, the right to social security, the right to housing, etc. All of these things take up goods that most of us acquire in the marketplace, and yet we're saying are so fundamental to a human life with dignity that there's um, a need to think of them as um, essential for a life worth living and therefore something that it is urgent we make sure that all people can enjoy. Third is the idea that once we're committed to that access, it's going to require government intervention. It's going to require a government role in policy making and in funding to achieve that universal access. Uh, that this cannot be left entirely to the market, just as we cannot leave education or health care entirely to the market. It's urgent for government to play a role to make sure that the system works to create access for the poor as well as for the affluent. So what does this mean for intellectual property? First, uh, on, a, on a philosophical level, the right to science and culture is in deep tension with intellectual property law. Because the right to science and culture uh, is focused on diffusion, is focused on access. It specifically opposes the privatization of knowledge. And that is precisely what intellectual property protection tries to achieve, right? Intellectual property is about the propertization and exclusion. That doesn't mean necessarily that we have a situation in which one of these always has to trump the other, but it means that we have a situation of tension in which we have to think carefully about what that interface should properly look like. Uh, more pragmatically as well, we can see that intellectual property frustrates the right to science and culture because intellectual property makes technological goods more expensive. Uh, here on the right, you have a, a generic drug. On the left, you have the exact same drug, but now with its price inflated by patent protection and trademark protection. Three cents, two dollars. That is the stark difference of the cost of intellectual property protection uh, on technologies. And an example um, from the copyright side of things as well, Brad Meltzer's novel costs nine times uh, Charles Dickens, not because the paper was nine times more expensive to print on, and not because Brad Meltzer is nine times a better author than Charles Dickens, but because the, his publisher has a monopoly on that book, and no publisher has a monopoly on A Tale of Two Cities, because that's in the public domain. So Brad Meltzer's publisher is a price setter. The publishers who um, distribute A Tale of Two Cities are price takers. They compete. That drives down the cost. So in all of these areas, intellectual property makes technology more expensive. And what you're looking at here is the champagne glass of global income distribution. Each layer, colored layer in this is a quintile of the world's population. And you can see that the 20%, the richest 20%, uh, have the, the largest volume of wealth to spend. So if you are a price setter and you are setting prices on your goods, you're going to pitch them to the red section and you're not going to price them affordable even to the yellow section. So that's a problem from the perspective of human rights. When we care about equity and if we're committed to the idea that all people should have access to life improving technologies. And we've seen that articulated already as a conflict between the right to health and drug patents, between the right to food and seed patents, between the right to education and copyright on learning materials. But where my theory of the right to science and culture and a commitment of access to new technologies comes in and suggests is that this is not just an incidental tension in some areas with technologies that are unique uh, in their importance for human rights, such as medicines or uh, uh, seeds for farming. But this is a systematic tension, uh, and it's something that human rights law systematically has a complaint to make. Ranging everything I've written recently about intellectual property 
at patent protection and patent disputes uh, as inflating the cost of electronic technology, tying that to the, the recent uh, smartphone dispute, but more basically putting the, cart, the horse before the cart, uh, access to electricity uh, is something that we can think about as being one of these technologies. You know, we can't pin it to the right to health or the right to food, uh, but it is basic and important uh, to living standards. So where is this, this going? Where are we in this process of norm development? Uh, this is the same report that Jessica referred to, uh, Farida Shahid's report uh, on the uh, right to culture, I'm sorry, on the, the right to science in the context of cultural rights, which was adopted by the Human Rights Council in July of 2012. Uh, and we can think of this also as picking up on, on Audrey's challenge to move from the, the broad, high normative abstract to the specific of state obligations. Among the recommendations uh, that the Special Rapporteur put in that report, I include uh, several that refer to build on this concept of the right to science as implying a right of access to new technologies, such as ensure that innovations essential for a life with dignity reach everyone. Uh, also, direct provision is going to be appropriate in the context of some technologies. Uh, that may include electricity, telephone, computer utilities. Uh, and this is my favorite, let us guard against promoting privatization of knowledge to an extent that deprives individuals of their opportunity to enjoy the fruits of scientific progress, which means we have to reconsider the maximalist approach to intellectual property and explore the view truths again of a more minimalist approach. So this is specifically calling for a rebalancing of intellectual property law on the basis of the right to science. Uh, my hope is that these, um, as we continue to develop this norm with specificity, that it will take hold in uh, the case law development of national level courts that are sympathetic. We've heard already some talk about um, India's creative jurisprudence regarding human rights and intellectual property. Uh, South Africa as being another context in which there's potential for that, uh, and uh, Colombia as well, just to give a few examples. But before that can happen, I think scholars still have a number of remaining conceptual challenges to address and to satisfactorily solve uh, before advocates and courts are going to feel in a position where they're, they're confident they can wrap their heads around this right, that they have a stable understanding of it, and that they can legitimately uh, adjudicate on the basis of it. One of those challenges is to specifically define our state duties. Uh, and by placing this in the framework of socioeconomic rights and thinking about access to technology, similar to access to education or access to healthcare, we know that we need to think about concepts such as progressive realization, minimum core content, uh, and I think in this context it's very important to examine the burdens for justifying state-imposed burdens on the right. Intellectual property is a burden on the right of access to new technologies. We need a workable framework that explains when that burden is justified uh, and when intellectual property protections must give way. Second, which technologies are we talking about, right? The Special Rapporteur spoke of innovations essential for a life to dignity and the priority needs of marginalized popula populations. So it's easy to imagine that that includes medicines, water treatment, and electricity. But what about the internet? And more broadly, what do we do with this problem of technological change? Can there be a human right to something that didn't exist 20 years ago? Uh, and how do we explain the apparent paradox there, changing content of human rights? Third is reconciling the access and protection dimensions of the right to science and culture. Uh, and I really like what Graham had to say about this, um, that this is this is the dragon in the room. Uh, you have to have a theory of what the protection element means uh, and uh, where it is going to fit in. How does protecting the moral and material interests fit or conflict with expanding access to technology until that's addressed? Very difficult uh, for courts to, um, to move forward with this. And last, advocacy strategies. Um, as we move from theory to practice, what are the fora? Uh, in, in which this is likely to be advanced well, what are the specific issues or causes that should be brought first? Uh, and I think the question of constituency 
matters greatly. Um, AAAS has been able to do very important and helpful work uh, advancing the right uh, human rights framework around the scientific enterprise because there is a constituency of scientists there who see this as their issue. Who are the constituencies that can be tapped to take the cause of access to technology uh, and to, to advocate it uh, and run with it? So I'll conclude there and look forward to questions and criticisms.